there are a lot of people who are well-meaning but misguided actually cause quite a lot of harm without meaning to then when it comes to ai it's just such a part of my life it's a part of everything i do yes i believe that there's a lot of potential in it and that's why i post about ai and about education <music> Hi, and welcome back to the Shifting Schools podcast. My name is Trisha Friedman. I will be hosting without Jeff Udick today. He's on the road delivering what I am sure is more high quality professional development for incredible educators like you. This episode is looking at ways to see artificial intelligence technology as a barrier destroyer. What does it mean for us to really position this technology as one that we understand is going to change the way we think of access. I'm joined today by the incredible Laura Hermeses, who is a disability consultant, a speaker, an author. Uh, Laura hosts her own podcast and she's an AI practitioner. We're diving into the intersection of ableism, artificial intelligence, and education. We're going to explore ways that we can really be thinking about AI as an assistive technology that enhances access and equity. Laura is going to share about some personal experiences and insights as well. And I am just thrilled to have her on the show. I've been connected with her on LinkedIn for a while now, and she's always posting such informative, insightful things in that space. You'll be able to learn more about this week's guest by heading over to the show notes. Before we we welcome her on the show. We do have a quick word from our podcast show sponsor. Shifting Schools is excited to be sponsored by newlight.io. Their platform is designed to simplify MTSS frameworks for personalized student support. Built by leading experts, New Light focuses on getting educators the answers they need fast. Which students need which levels of support? With simple data collection and insightful analytics powered by AI, Newlight's platform provides actionable solutions to support your students effectively. Try it for free at newlight.io. That's N-E-U-L-I-G-H-T dot I-O. Check the link in the show notes to learn more. Hey folks, FETC, that's the Future of Education Technology Conference, is just around the corner, happening January 14th through 17th, 2025 in Orlando. It's your chance to be part of the first and best EdTech event of the year. As a special offer, just for the Shifting Schools community, you can use promo code SHIFTING10 at checkout for an extra 10% off and all access or session passes. Head to FETC.org to register today, save, and get ready to bring the future of education into your school. That's SHIFTING10, all caps, SHIFTING10 at FETC.org for an additional 10% off. Offer ends December 13th. And with that, on with the show. And with that, on with the show. Laura, you're prolific on LinkedIn, and I really appreciate it because you've got so many posts that are speaking about ableism in very creative ways. And something that I've been looking at explicitly, we're going to talk a little bit about AI in this conversation, is that we have this technology now that we can prompt that's going to help us better understand if our framing language is always evolving or if a metaphor that I'm using might be considered ableist. Um, and I'm really impressed at that test and how often it will, it will really get it right. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on artificial intelligence or generative AI as a means to rethink access and equity. So first of all, I want to thank you for doing that because a lot of people just don't bother. And there are so many 
even for me who who lives this every day, I still make mistakes. I make missteps. I say things I shouldn't have because what a lot of people don't realize is that just because I have one kind of disability or two or three doesn't mean I have complete insight and I don't have sensitivity to everything. And um, I sometimes feel like I should, but that's obviously nobody does. So, um, yes, it's, it's very useful for that uh, to check ourselves. But also when it comes to access and equity, I could probably speak for days because I think that you can't really speak about one without speaking about the other. So especially in South Africa, where I am, <clears throat> there's a lot of a lot of inequality, which means that as amazing as AI can be for both access and equity, there are always going to be people who are left behind. So if we speak about first, so let's take the, the educational context. So if we speak about first, those who have relative privilege, you know, you've got kids who have access to devices, to connectivity, to all of those things. It really levels the play, playing field for kids, especially those who maybe have more diverse needs. If I think of a relative of mine who has pretty bad dyslexia, he didn't have access to a special school, but he did have access to a parent who could read his homework to him. He had access to a reader at the school during exam time who could read the questions to him. He had certain accesses that allowed him to finish high school, and now he is currently pursuing tertiary education. And he's able to do that because he has this access, which he wouldn't necessarily have had before. Because he's still very young, he's coming up with AI now in his tertiary education, and he has all these amazing, he's got speech to text, he's got AI to check his essay questions, all of these things, which is fantastic for him. But then I think of a child maybe who doesn't, who's in a, who has the same challenges that he has, but maybe has a parent who has to work long hours, maybe a single parent household, maybe doesn't have access to a device. Or as is so often the case, and not only in rural areas, like just poorer areas. I mean, we've got so much inequality. We have people living in areas where they have a device or they have a device shared amongst a few people, but connectivity is just not not a thing. You know, so there are cell phone games and that's what devices are used for. They're not used for, the, the possibilities are completely closed off to them and the parents don't have the knowledge of it. The teachers are under-resourced, under-trained and they've got this, all of this at their fingertips, but they don't really. A lot of, so so equity, like I said, I can talk about equity for a really long time, but then if you talk about like, for example, a child with dyspraxia who can't get to school on time, I mean, punctuality for somebody with dyspraxia is just not a thing. It's just, I've I've watched somebody close to me try and my goodness, they try, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Um, amongst that, there's, there's planning, there's deadlines, things like that. And in high school, you know, you, without those kinds of skills, like being able to meet a deadline without being prompted or trying to get to school, you can't do that. So if we look at it from that point of view, and we're looking at slightly more privileged children or learners, students, whatever, um, I, my hope is that that kind of access can be improved with flexible learning environments and flexible learning environments, whether it be homeschooling or online schooling, are a lot more possible with AI. And even if I just think of myself, I, I even from a from a, a non disability lens, I mean, I struggled with calculus. It was absolute. And I'm not the only one. That's why it's called calculus. I think calculus is, yeah, it's like a synonym for for, for art. Yeah, <laughs> right. So if I had had, but my teacher couldn't explain it to me, not because she wasn't, she just didn't communicate in a way that I could really relate to or understand. Or, um, And I don't know if that was like some neurodivergence or it was just a mismatch, but the fact of the matter is I never got it. But if I had had AI to explain it to me, I would have gotten a lot further because if you don't, the way that school is, is if you fall off the wagon at one point, you don't get back on. Yeah. So, and so, so that 
that that really excites me that possibility and that personalization and i mean some kids also i'm not talking about learning styles here but some kids do better with more structure some kids do better with less especially when you're talking about um sensory sensitivities and um like uh emotional regulation and you're talking about executive functioning we need different things to thrive and that is really what the possibilities of AI represent to me. I was actually talking to a, a connection on LinkedIn the other day, and he summed it up perfectly. He said, LinkedIn, he said that, like, not LinkedIn, sorry, AI is basically one big assistive device mm -hmm. because it just makes everything that we need, everything I would have needed, I mean, high school with chronic fatigue was an absolute ordeal for me. I couldn't learn. And if I had had that flexibility and if I had had those possibilities and I'd had that personalized learning and I'd had communication styles that I could understand, I feel like I would have thrived and I feel like I would have done differently. And I feel like my journey <laughs> to like my tertiary qualifications would have been a little bit more linear than it was. And I, I think on top of that, you know, the academics, I couldn't agree with you more. I experienced this firsthand a few weeks ago. I was working on a project. It needed Python coding. I don't know Python coding. I was able to have ChatGPT write the code for me, and it made me curious. So I was going back and forth and saying, wait, can you explain that? And there was a part of me that felt like maybe I actually could learn Python, and I have never felt that way before. Um, and so I, I also just think there's that real, oh, maybe I can. And then there's also the the social piece. Um, I'm neurodivergent. Social situations make me very uh, anxious. You know, I often know that I'll be going into a conversation. And for a very long time, I've always felt like, gosh, I wish I could rehearse that. And so that's why I've created a lot of prompts where I can set up a role rehearsal scenario, which is not to say that it's replacing the human communication piece. It's building my capacity to have those better conversations. And I think that is such a game changer. And, you know, I think about the difference that could have made for me as a teen when I feel like social interaction, um, you know, full stop can be. Mm. anxiety inducing. And um, I, I just, I think that framing of it as, uh, yeah, it, it, and assistive technology is such a powerful one. And that's where sometimes when I hear folks say things that are fear-based and I understand, you know, the, the fears and we should have concerns around AI. And we're also in a media ecosystem where that's the story that gets pumped again and again and again. So Sometimes I hear folks say things like, oh, this is just going to completely corrode our humanity. And I think, wait a second, for whom is school very humane in the first place? And who isn't it? Um, and just, you know, what are some of the positive use cases that maybe are not uh, media headline click worthy? You know, like, unfortunately, I think the, uh, the media landscape doesn't often uh, profit or benefit from some of those happier anecdotes no i mean fear i think is is um, a great motivator so it motivates us to to click um I, I i understand what you were saying i'd like to to just respond you were talking about social situations and i mean my goodness i you know i used to obsess like I, it's taken me a long time to learn not to obsess about something small that I said six months ago that may or may not actually have offended somebody. Um, and I, I also, with my sensory sensitivities, I cannot do crowds. Um, so I've actually created a, a GPT that is an understanding, <laughs> empathic, kind person who reassures me it's it's our persona. It's not a person, obviously. This is your anti AI, know, right? Yes, it's Aunt yes. May. And I, I mean, I know, I know she's not real, but I still get that kind of reassurance from her. It, um, and yeah, it's so I've I've written about it, but I mean, 
I didn't build it for myself, but in the meantime, I've started using her and she's really been helpful because you don't also always want to um, necessarily, <clears throat> I, I, I thought of it when with my, my niece who's in her teens now and, you know, has uh, asks me some questions that sometimes that she needs an aunt for and that I wish I had an aunt for. Um, but sometimes you just need somebody who's going to listen without any judgment and who has no skin in the game. So it has to be somebody who's cl close enough but also who's not involved. And that's a very difficult line to find. I mean, impossible to find, I think, without, um, you know, being able to pay for it sometimes, right? Like, yes. because in essence, you're also talking about maybe like a life coach or a therapist, things that, again, you want to talk about equity exactly. and access, you know, for, for a lot of folks that's without range. But I, I think it's also just the activity, I'm guessing, of you designing that persona is such an interesting reflective activity and a self-compassion and self-care piece. Uh, I, I have a loved one who's uh, going through radiation at the moment for a cancer diagnosis, and they were kind of confused at some of the information the doctor was giving them in terms of different treatment programs. And I designed a bot that had all the research on the different programs and uh, this person really loves the, a character from a TV show. So I had it kind of take on that mm. voice and it's it's a comedy. So it was really interesting how that was the piece that made some of the research feel more accessible. So I'm thinking about this idea of GPT design for care for self and others. Um, that's that's actually beautiful. Um, I I hadn't considered consider that kind of application. And I, I just think that would be amazing. Well, and I shouldn't say like, I'm not, I'm definitely not the, the first to do it. Uh, when I was working on it, I wanted to see what else is out there. And there is something called Oncobot that um, has actual oncologists who monitor it and it will text with you. Um, yeah. So I, again, I just think the, the possibilities when we get in the mind frame of what if we use this for good? Like that's the kind of hackathon I would love to see happen is how can we take this technology and really use it for care? Um, you have this other post on LinkedIn. I'll be sure to link to it. It's called AI in the living room. And it looks at how we can just model, you know, conversations in our home. And, and I think there's so much power in having those informal it's actually for fun. You know, not everything has to have this academic uh, goal to it. Can you say more about the story that you shared in that post? So the first story I shared, I think, was um, I started with a story of my sister who was struggling with her last exam, and there was something that she just could not get into her brain. And then I made up a funny story because I was done and I was bored, and I decided to help her. Um, and she remembered, and she aced the questions because it made us both laugh uproariously. Well, in this moment of stress, by the way, so that also really helped. And um, then my niece, who I've mentioned, <clears throat> came to our house and she's, we've been introducing her to AI a lot because, I mean, it's so valuable for her. She's, we started, she's 13 now. So we've started really from the very beginning since we started using it, since ChatGPT really became a thing she would ask us what a word meant and we would just leave it open and say, ask chat GPT. And then she would say, but I don't understand the explanation. So we would say, and this is, I think the thing that one, everybody needs to use, tell it to ask it to explain to you like you're five. So she would go explain it like I'm five. And then she would go down a rabbit hole. Um, she looked up. So she's like a lot of people. I was going to say teenage girls, but it goes beyond that. She's a complete Taylor Swift fan. So, she wanted to look up stuff about Taylor Swift and then she got came across the word philanthropy. So she looked that up and there was this whole rabbit hole and she went home with a vocabulary that was much bigger than, than it had been when she arrived. And this has happened every time she's visited us. Um, so then she asked us, can she use it for studying? So we said, absolutely. And I recall this. And of course, in the meantime, I've learned all about, mnemonic devices and storytelling and um you know the power of narrative for stickiness and learning theory and all of those things <laughs> and i um i asked chat gpt to create a story 
and it did. And she remembered the entire story. She remembered a funny little poem. And so she remembered, she still remembers it now, months later. So the, the, this is a story that I included, but I didn't include what had happened before that she was going down these rabbit holes and what happened after because she thought it was a lot of fun. And she's been using it to look things up and also to expand not only her vocabulary, but her interests, because I think I wrote about this one as well. But it in, in co-creating stories that she would enjoy with ChatGPT or prompting it at least to do so, she's also gotten into reading, which was something that she was not interested uh -huh. in at all. And then she's also recorded herself reading these stories. And she's she's learned the the, the the suspense because it has to generate the next part. Um, so it, she can't just keep reading, which is amazing. And she now wants to come and she wants to read. And I was saying that we had taken her, we always try to take her somewhere she hasn't been or show her something new. So, I mean, we've taken her to the lion sanctuary, which she loved. She totally loves lions. We've taken her um, on a boat ride which she hadn't been on a boat before, you know, to a little island full of seals. It was, and yet playing with ChatGPT for an entire day, she said, she turned to us at the end of the day and said, this is the best time I've ever had with you hmm. just because she was creating these stories and she'd gone down these rabbit holes and, and we actually did not even know if it would work. Um, so, so yes, I've, I've waffled on a, a little bit, but, but this, it's, it's so much more than that one story because everything she does is beneficial and it's educational and yet it feels like fun to her. Educators, are you searching for a new space to connect, collaborate and grow? Well, Camp Shifting Schools is your new home. With the decline of X, formerly Twitter, we're here to offer a safe, welcoming community where you can join other passionate teachers. Take part in free courses, webinars, and live AMA sessions to evaluate your practice. Ready to join the conversation? Head over to camp.shiftingschools.com and become part of the camp community today. Learning and connecting awaits. Uh, well, and I, I wonder if it, you know, the, the power, especially for younger learners whose agency is often restricted in schools, just simply that agency and power to this is what I want to learn about. And these are the questions that I have and the immediacy of the feedback. And, you know, chat GPT is never going to say that's sorry, we don't have time for that question. And it's never going to say you're jumping ahead. I will get to that next term. Mm. Yeah. I, again, I think how interesting it would be. I know we talk a lot about like the Google 20% time and, kind of the, the personal project, uh, it would be just really interesting for students to have even like 20 minutes. Where did you go? Because also what a great way to learn about our students. You know, how often are their curiosities either, you know, said, sorry, that does, we don't have space for that here. That We can't talk about that. Um, but, you know, I bet ChatGPT could really help your niece out in terms of like, how could you take Taylor Swift and create a math line of inquiry about it. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking that would be just the metrics in terms of how long it took her to get to the level of fame she's at. And, you know, like uh, all of the different sort of ways you might visualize that as a fractal could be really interesting. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Laura, on the, you know, math is not my strength. So ChatGPT would probably come up with a better idea. But yeah, I, I, I think that's a real opportunity here is whatever your interest is, you now have a tool that can help fuel. And I'm guessing, you know, as you said, she's going to take that interest away from ChatGPT and be applying it in different ways. And what an incredible opportunity. I feel like if I had ChatGPT when I was a kid, like where in the world is Carmen San Diego? I don't know if that's a cultural reference you know, but I would have gone so much further with um it was a Commodore 64 game that I adored, absolutely adored. So um we actually she asked for a, a GPT that we built her. Um 
to explain sort of complex concepts in Taylor Swift lyrics. <laughs> and of course it doesn't work equally for all all concepts, but it 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 really excited her. Um and she did learn a lot about different concepts because then she would go, oh, wait, this doesn't really make sense. I'm gonna look it up. Um but then she would look it up. Also I just you know I look at my my nephew, he's he's almost four, and I look at his level of curiosity. And if that could be fostered, she didn't she's 13 so she didn't have this all along but if i look at him now he's curious and every question he has gets answered sometimes by me sometimes by his mom and sometimes by chat gpt and um he's he's already using it he he does obviously his typing isn't all that at his age um because he's not four yet but he uses a speech to text speech to image and he has learned to say, explain it like I'm four. Mm. And um, which is incredible because he's getting this as well. And um, he's, he's, so his curiosity is constantly fostered and satisfied. And it's not going to be, I hope it's not going to be smothered like, like it is for many of so many of us. I, yeah, that, that is my hope as well. And that's why I think it's so important that we do frame this as a technology that can shift access and agency. Laura, you're a disability consultant, and we'll make sure your information is in the show notes for folks who would like to learn more. What else are you paying attention to specifically with that lens when it comes to AI? Um, that's not actually a simple question to answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me start by saying that I like to tell, so I'm involved in some um, volunteer mentorship. And I, I, I tell people, you can actually do anything now. You were speaking about the Python. I also am not a coder. <laughs> I, can, I can read Python, but I certainly can't write it. And sometimes even the reading gets a little complicated. But I, I can, I have created, um, applications and things using Python. So um, because of ChatGPT, and I keep saying you can do anything now, you really can, but people don't necessarily consider what to ask, what they can ask. And that's often the actual barrier. You know, you can't, you can't ask it. You've probably seen my, my experiments that I did when I first started using it on a daily basis. I tried it for everything from, um, you know, how to make the bed more easily to uh, how to make a, a slide deck when, when I'm out of spoons. So, <clears throat> so I'm, I, I re this is preamble. It's going to make sense in a minute. It's, it's actually relevant. So I use it for everything. I use it for absolutely everything I've, I've used it for. Um, so I don't, I don't use it for medical advice as such, mm -hmm. but I ask it to look, do you have any suggestions for me to take to my doctor? Mm -hmm. And then I actually do take them to my doctor, you know, so um, I've got CVIDs, which is a, an immunity. And I said to ChatGPT, for example, look, this is my problem. Can you suggest anything? And then it said, you know, get enough sleep and blah, 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 which get enough sleep is also a completely useless thing to say to me because not for lack of trying. And then I said, okay, but like, if you had to think out of the box, assume I'm doing all the regular things. And it gave me a suggestion, which I then took to my GP. He referred me to a specialist. And here we are. I'm actually getting the same treatment that ChatGPT suggested now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I use it for all of those things. I use it for absolutely everything. So when I say it's not an easy question to answer, I use it for whatever is need needed. Um, there's nothing that I think, oh, I can't ask ChatGPT that. So... The, the needs of people with disabilities are so diverse um, and even the needs of organizations. Uh, that's why if you look on my website, you'll see it's, it's tailored. Everything I do is tailored to the needs of the organization or the individual. Um, I've also, what is, is very close to my heart is, is accommodations, reasonable accommodations, because I've seen the worst of it and the, the best of it, to be honest, in, in my career, and in my different positions and roles, I've seen how badly it can be done, how well it can be done, and how it allowed me to stay in formal employment for much longer than I would have been able to ha had I not had that fantastic experience in the last place I worked. 
So I've used it to create accommodations checklists. I've used it to organize my thoughts. So I don't use, I don't rely on it for anything, but I collaborate with it on everything. It, it augments what I'm allowed to think of. Also, I'll say, you know, these are the things I've thought of. What have I missed? Or this is a brain dump. Can you please just organize it for me? Even for, for, so, so, so even for, if I don't know, if somebody comes to me, somebody did come to me and they said, look, um, their cousin has cancer. They're not sure how to support them. Can I offer anything? So I said, look, I'm going to have to get back to you because I'm not a cancer survivor. Um, I, I, I have been there for cancer survivors. Um, I have family, but it's not necessarily, it's not the same. It's, you know, it's different for everybody. The experience is different. The support systems are different. And then I will turn to ChatGPT and say, look, these are the facts. This is what I have. This is what I'm thinking of. What do you think? And I, yes, I anthropomorphize it and I treat it like a person, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I am, I know it's, it's not, I know it's not um, a person and I would not give it to a child or a teen or someone super impressionable, but I have had people actually ask me for Aunt May because mm. they just want somebody to talk to, but they don't actually want to talk to a person because sometimes you, you do want to talk to a person and sometimes you really don't. There are times that you just, that your self-consciousness or whatever takes over. So I can't give you a list of use cases is my, my, my answer because depending on who you are and what you need, it's going to be different, but you can be pretty sure that whatever it is, I'm going to use AI. Oh, I think you gave me something better than a list of use cases. You reiterated how experimentation and divergent thinking and just being willing to play and test really is the most essential thing. Um, and, you know, especially with this technology that's evolving because uh, I'm, I'm guessing you've noticed, like I have, some of the requests that I made early on, like I'm thinking recipes, early days of chat GPT, I found the recipes weren't that great. Um, I've actually come to, and maybe it's in part, I'm doing some better prompting for them, but I've actually created some really great recipes with chat GPT. <laughs> um, and so I think that point about continuing to test and to do so with transparency, like Laura, I so admire that you're doing that on LinkedIn. Hi folks. We'll get back to our conversation in just a moment. I want to talk a bit more about newlight.io, the AI FERPA compliant, that's our federal guidelines around privacy of student data, platform making personalized student support a breeze. You know student pri privacy is huge in our schools and Newlight is big on privacy as well. It was one of the first questions I asked the co-founder Jose about. There are a few AI systems out there that meet the requirements to being FERPA compliant, and Newlight does just that. Newlight's IntelliTier platform is more than just a data collection tool. It's an AI-powered assistant that has been trained to truly understand the MTSS framework, student context, and school-specific resources. Developed by a team with both social, emotional, and behavioral needs in mind, and with plans to extend into academic support soon. Studies show effective MTSS and SEL implementations can boost attendance, improve grades, and increase graduation rates. Yet many schools struggle with the complexities of gathering data and turning that data into actionable items within the MTSS process. Newlight's IntelliTier platform makes it easy with simple, fast data collection, asynchronous collaboration across the MTSS team, and actionable insight that educators can implement and document their success with. Plus, Newlight is advised by seasoned educators and administrators, so they understand your everyday classroom challenges. You have to try it out for yourself. So head over to newlight.io to give it a try for free. That's N-E-U 
L-I-G-H-T dot I-O. Thank you to New Light for taking this on and a proud sponsor of the Shifting Schools community. To what extent is that part important either for you? Like, you know, you mentioned just the organizing of thoughts. I know it can be useful in that way, right? Like I have an audience and this is kind of a nudge to reframe my thinking. Is that why you're sharing so much so generously over there? Or is it because you're hoping other people will also, you know, make their version of the ante? So to be honest, I started sharing on LinkedIn because I had stuff to say. That <laughs> that was it. And then then I realized <clears throat> I posted something about disability because obviously that's top of mind for me. Well, most of the time. Um, and somebody reached out to me and she said to me that her daughter, her young daughter has just been diagnosed with, I think, rheumatoid arthritis. And it just meant so much to her just to know she's not alone and that there are resources and there are people who care and that somebody is, is, is fostering awareness. And from there, it kind of snowballed. So I'm going to say no. Um, that's, that's not why. Um, it's because I want people to know that they're not alone. Mm. It's because I want, that is my, my primary goal with the disability posts. I want also, there are a lot of people who are well-meaning, but misguided and they, they can actually cause quite a lot of harm without meaning to. So I also hope that it's that. And then when it comes to to AI. It's just such a part of my life. It's a part of everything I do. So it's not, yes, I believe that there's a lot of potential in it. And that's why I post about AI and about education, especially because I look at my experience at school um, as somebody with, who had disabilities, as somebody who just didn't, wasn't suited to it. And I, I mentioned my niece and my nephew. I don't want that for them. I don't want that for any kids. I have, I'm blessed with a lot of children in my life and I want them to have a different experience to the one I had. So if somebody can gain comfort from an aunt, that's great. But if somebody gains, can gain a change, a change in, in environment or support, or comfort from some of my posts that's that's what i what i'm really hoping for i i'm trying to be the person i wish i had well again listeners i will link to laura's linkedin profile you definitely have things to say and i'm so glad you're saying them in that space um it's a reminder to me you know those our social networks i know sometimes people belittle how significant they can be but for me, I would say, you know, you're talking about the need for school to change. I feel like the amount of learning I have done because of certain social networks, um, yeah, like it's it has been a very formal part of my adult education that I'm so grateful for. So, Laura, I'm very grateful to have you in my network, and I look forward to continuing to follow you. Thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast and, and sharing your thoughts with our listeners. Thank you, Trisha, and thank you for having me and for listening to me waffle and also for your presence on LinkedIn because it is so valuable to me. The opposite of, I don't know what the opposite of waffling is, but you, you did waffle. <laughs> I'll have to keep, I'll ask ChatGPT what the op- opposite of waffling is. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Hey there, dedicated listener. If you've made it this far, we know you're passionate about shifting the way education works. And Trisha and I appreciate you. If you loved what you heard today, we'd be so grateful if you could take a moment to rate and review Shifting Schools wherever you listen to podcasts. Those ratings help us reach even more educators just like you. And if you know someone who could benefit from these conversations, please share this episode with them. Just one person. Think of the impact we can make together. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter for even more great content. And if you haven't already, join us at Camp Shifting Schools where the conversations keep going long after the podcast end. Thank you for being part of this journey and thank you for being part of Shifting Schools.